Good job, Magic. Ugh. All right, Magic figured out how to operate the standing desk. Let's go back down. Okay, that was not exactly the start I wanted. I just wanted cute cat start. But now that we're here, um, I just wanted to have a chance to have a very informal chat with you all here for this final lecture. There is a planned lecture which goes through a whole bunch of um, you know, data science reports to give you an idea of the industry and kind of review some of the things we did and give different perspectives on uh, some of the, some of the uh, possibilities of machine learning and data science. But I don't want to do that this, this quarter. This quarter is a little different for a bunch of obvious reasons. So what I really wanted to do was just kind of finish off with an informal chat and a southern end of a northbound cat for all of you. So let's just kind of think about three things, I think, here while we close out the quarter. Uh, first off, I want to be thankful, okay? This has been super difficult. We have all been put in situations that we don't want to be in. And, you know, problems existed, and we've all stuck through it, gotten through it, and done what we could to be kind to each other and to work together to solve this crazy, crazy time. I'm thankful for you all and your patience and your help and the work and effort that everybody put into making this class work. Um, I hope that you've had an experience that, you know, is going to be valuable for you in the future. That maybe if you, you know, are still going to kind of remember it as a, a time of struggle, at least at the end of it, maybe it will be seen as a time of growth as well. So... That's the first thing I wanted to say, is thanks to all of you, and I hope that you have um, a similar, you know, understanding and warm feeling about the, what we accomplished, uh, that it isn't all just kind of ashes in your mouth. So the second thing I wanted to talk about was just generally the idea of where are we going from here? What does your future as a data science student, whether you're a major or whether you're somebody who's just picking this up as something on the side, what, what does that look like? Where are you going with this stuff? So I think the important thing to realize is that the need for data science is built into the way we work nowadays. I don't think that we're going to see data science change in any way except new technology and you know new tools and new reasons to do it there's always going to be a job that involves people thinking analytically solving problems using the quantitative information and sometimes qualitative information that's out there in huger and huger amounts every year um, that's always going to be a feature. Now, the nature of the job's technical things, what the job gets called might change, right? All these things are up for grabs. We will find that our world, when you graduate, is not going to look like the data science report that I'm going to send to you all, right? So, um, five years' time, Technologies will be different. The, uh, the job titles that people generally have might be a smidgen different. But there's going to be a need for people like you who are thoughtful, who are conscientious, who make sure that they double check things and, you know, go that extra mile to make sure that an analysis is correct. There's going to be a place for people who can use 
um, who can think in terms of shades of gray, who can say, we don't know the answer for these reasons, but for these other reasons, this is probably the best idea here, right? And can back that best idea up with evidence, not just opinion. And then also admit when that evidence is lacking, right? Somebody who can redirect a team that is going off the rails, right? And when people have kind of got an idea and they're like, ah, I'm going to, and you're like, no, that's such a bad idea. Here's the problems with that. And you find the kind and gentle way to inform people, to bring them around to understanding the, uh, the, the evidence as you see it. Or maybe you try your hardest, but you're not successful and you accept that the team is going in this direction and you do your best to make it succeed, right? These are all qualities that are going to be valuable in somebody working in data science. And I've seen that in many of you. I've seen elements of this in every person who's come to talk with me about their projects. I've seen it in the work people do on these assignments and in these readings. And so I think that you're all on up to a wonderful start. And I'm excited for you to make further progress down that path. So for those who are majors who are trying to make this their thing, then uh, you've got a lot of exciting stuff in front of you. You should definitely explore all kinds of options through the HDSI and through the other departments around that are offering data science, machine learning, statistics. Everybody's going to have their own interests, and you're going to be able to design, to some extent, the emphasis of your program and what you get into. Maybe you're way into, you know, um, these visualizations and these web technologies that enable you to make these interactive stories. Great! You're going to have a load of fun, and there are courses and labs here on campus that you're going to be able to pursue that. Maybe you're super into uh, deep learning and machine learning, and you're going to get into the nitty gritty of the theoretical end of it and the computational efficiencies of it. And you're going to have a great time. And there's people here on campus that you should get involved with. Maybe you're somebody who actually is uh, really all about like the way in which data affects people. And you're going to get involved in the uh, Center for AI Ethics here on campus. You're going to get involved with maybe the communication department, which, you know, is looking at how all these technologies affect people and the role of it in society, maybe the philosophy department, right? You're still a data scientist. You're just using the data for other purposes. And data and data science is also applicable to education and it's applicable to, um, you know, hardcore sciences like physics or biology, right? We will need data scientists in all those roles. People who can think critically about the data, use the numbers, and come up with paths forward to understanding in situations where it's sometimes not even clear what the right question to ask is, right? I think a lot of you experienced that one when you were trying to define your projects, right? Just figuring out what question to ask can be an enormous undertaking. And, uh, you know, to quote G.I. Joe, half the battle. So, again, this is... I think the beginning of an exciting time for you. Now, for those of you that are not majors, who are just interested in data science, and you're also, you know, totally welded to a different path as a career, that's super cool. Because you're going to become important people in endeavors that value quantitative information. So remember that data science, if you remember that Venn diagram, right? where data science is at this intersection between math and computer programming 
and domain-specific knowledge. So you become a journalist, right? And you become a data journalist like our guest Ben, okay? Or you become a economist and you become one of those economists that knows how to do the actual big data analyses of these giant economic data sets, right? There's this important role for people who have the domain knowledge the people who really understand what's being measured and why we're measuring it and what we want to get out of these measurements and which directions we can go using quantitative analyses. You're going to become the people who are central to these endeavors, who can speak enough data science and computer stuff to interact with the technical people who are going through the data science curriculum here. And you'll be on a team and you'll be, you know, the, the person who can translate between the two worlds, between the, you know, whatever the topic is and the data science-y, machine learning-y, computer science-y sort of stuff. So kudos to you for putting a foot in both worlds. Okay. The last thing that I really wanted to talk about is just in terms of future tech and future problems that we're all going to face. I think people were generally excited for discussions of um, ethics and the algorithmic accountability and where we're going that direction. It's both something people can wrap their heads around and you can intuitively see it's important and you can see that in a future that goes wrong, we will be very, very sad. And in a future that goes exceptionally right, we still may not be without problems, right? These techniques are powerful. When we look at automated algorithms, whether they're in the hands of a data scientist or, uh, you know, operating in some, you know, like completely out of the way corner of the world that's just, you know, sitting there churning numbers. These things have the potential to impact large numbers of people, right? It's the algorithms which approve loans look at a whole bunch of data and say, yes, we trust you. No, we don't trust you. That changes people's lives. Right, whether they can get a loan for their business. The algorithms which, as we saw, sentence people, help to decide people's futures in prison. The algorithms that bring us the news and put us in our silos and bubbles of information. The algorithms which control uh, the flow of goods from one place to another, right? affect people's lives and the economies in those locations in important ways. Um, and then not just algorithms, but decisions made from data, right? Uh, it goes all the way back to uh, the Vietnam War when, uh, what's his name? The Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, was a guy who came from an accounting arm of, if I remember right, Ford Motor Company, right? He was a big business executive, somebody who believed in the numbers and making decisions by the numbers. And he brought this brand of decision-making of using quantitative information into the government uh, of, I think, Nixon? Uh, my memory of history can get fuzzy here especially since I'm speaking without notes, right? So, um, and McNamara brought this into the prosecution of the Vietnam War. And they used the numbers and they made decisions and they made some pretty terrible decisions and thought that they were winning the war when they completely were not because the numbers lied. The numbers were the, you know, uh, they were measurements 
like the lamppost thing that I talked about in the last lecture, right? They were measurements that were easy to make, but they weren't the truth. They weren't what they actually wanted to see. And they were obscured for all kinds of reasons. And so a string of really bad decisions were made that got like thousands and thousands of people killed. So decision-making, quantitative or, you know, just <laughs> Kentucky windage, let's just try that because I feel like it, right? Decision-making causes problems as much as it makes solutions. And our goal as data scientists is to try to set up the structure of the world so that we avoid as many of the bad consequences as we can, right? We know we can't solve the world. We cannot make it perfect. We uh, can only aspire to making it a smidgen better. And if we get up and do our best and we use quantitative approaches because well, I mean, quantitative approaches fail. They do. We know why, right? Like the lamppost problem, because the measures were not what we needed to know. Or they fail because the model was wrong. Or they fail for reasons that, you know, we can't ever define. But quantitative models at least give us a chance of succeeding. And applying quantitative models in the right ways applying quantitative models <sighs> quantitative models inside of cultures that value them and that can argue about them in the right ways and iterate towards a improvement right so it's it's not just the model right it's the people and the culture around the model if you are in a job and the people around you don't value the quantitative. They're just using you as a flag. They're like, make the numbers say this. That's what we're going to do anyway, right? This happens. If you're in that job, get out, in my opinion. Okay? You want to be with people who think and feel the same way you do, who value coming to a correct decision and are not just trying to justify things that they want to do anyway. So our jobs as data scientists, it seems, are as much to change the culture as it is to apply our tools, right? If what we value is truth and finding our way towards something, you know, that's an improvement on what we're doing now, then I think it's pretty clear that what we have to work towards is not just better Python toolkits or m nicer visualizations, right? It's to change the culture around us to make people more numerate, more understanding of what data is and how to think about it, to educate people in like the basics of how statistics can be used for good or for evil, right? Um, we need to bring knowledge to other people and not just hire ourselves out to, you know, make the living, right? And I should walk back even that statement, right? Because there is no such thing as black and white. For somebody like me who, you know, is in a relatively comfortable position in my life, I can afford to make decisions like, I'm going to stop working here because I don't believe in it, right? Or uh, I'm not just going to chase cash. I'm going to chase a job which gives me fulfilled. I have privilege because I'm an established person with a, a bank account that can support me on a few months of unemployment. And I understand that for other people, including some of you, that won't be the case. Money will be tight. And getting the best paying job, no matter what it is doing, I can understand that. Right? But I also encourage you to aspire that once you are in a secure location to go ahead from time to time and just take a moment, right? So take a step back once a year, maybe. Set aside this time right around, you know, the holidays, maybe. And make sure that every year you spend an hour thinking deeply about where you want to be at this time next year. 
because it can make sense to reevaluate your your path. Um, DJ Patil, who's a famous data scientist, he was the uh, the first data scientist of the United States of America when President Obama made that an actual position. Um, he's come to campus a few times, and I'm going to get it wrong since I'm speaking extemporaneously here, but he has like this little saying about um like is it ship daily plan weekly uh do something monthly and you know think for the think in terms of years okay i've got the whole thing wrong because it's a beautiful ringing saying and you will all now go out and google dj patil and that little saying and you'll know what i mean okay but the point is this, right? You've got to manage your time in the future. You've got to manage it from, you know, getting the day-to-day -day done. Go, go, go. Ship the code, ship the code, ship the code, right? And at a weekly remove, plan for what's coming next. Get yourself a, a, a habit of doing this kind of organization, right? And every month, take a moment and think about the next month. And maybe two months or three months later, what do you need to do in those next three months? And once a year, at least, sit down and reevaluate. Where's your path for the distant future for years? Plan in term of years, right? Oh, set goals. Ha! I got part of it. Set goals in terms of years or something like that. Okay. You've got to have this kind of multi-scale thing going on to uh, achieve big goals, right? You've got to be able to manage both that day-to-day -day incremental and the month-to-month -month and really have long-term plans and then not be afraid to change them, right? It's okay to have a long-term plan that next year you go, you know what? No, it's changed. This is what I want now. That's valid, right? Don't feel like you're setting yourself in for decades and that's exactly where you're going to be. But without those goals, without those long-term plans, and without reevaluating them from time to time, you're going to find yourself, you know, potentially in a, a rut and uh, maybe where you find yourself unhappy, right? And once you do achieve... A kind of financial security again I encourage you to take risks and get yourself into something that satisfies you once you have that luxury to pursue it right that was all kind of digression about career stuff because I really just wanted to finish off talking about the future of models and AI but you know what it doesn't matter because you all are going to take more courses on this and uh, future you in those next courses is going to learn about bleeding edge stuff that you know current me doesn't know jack about and like i said tools don't matter skills at analytical thinking and you know uh, life habits to help you succeed those are the things that are going to give you the success in the future so i just want to, I think, close this out then. And I want to say how, again, how grateful I am for all of you that I uh, really looking forward to seeing what you all do. So I, I hope I'll have some of you in other classes that I'm teaching. I hope that uh, some of you will come back and tell me about where you've gone in one, five, ten years time. Okay? So, uh, good luck in all of your future endeavors, and um, I know that I can convey the heartfelt appreciation of the TAs, of Oshin and Avinash and Vicky, and uh, the IAs as well, who have really, you know, I think, seen some of you really blossom in your thought processes over this time. All right, everybody, good luck. Even Magic would say good luck if he was not somewhere bothering my wife. Bye.